I would like to add my personal um, congratulations to the three honorees, and particularly to the memory of Kovac Yeza, who became a very good friend uh, in the process of his work of collecting materials for the, uh, for the museum. Um, before I start, I have to apologize that the daughter of Neumann Janos can't address you in Hungarian. Unfortunately, at the age of three, I am told I spoke perfect Hungarian, but now I'm left just with the one sentence my grandmother taught me, and forgive my accent, Saratek Mojul Basil Nintenam Tudok Shokot. And that's all I can say. <laughs> So let me give you in English what I call the creation story. And the opportunity to give this talk touches my heart for several reasons. The subtitle of the conference, From Con Punched Cards to the Information Society, traces a history in which my father, Neumann Janos, uh, is a founding father. It's being held in the country of his birthplace which he abandoned when he foresaw it being swallowed up by the Nazi sweep across Europe, and which he never dared to revisit during his lifetime while it was under the dominance of Soviet communism. This occasion, celebrating the opening of a great new museum dedicated to the story of the modern computer and the world it made possible, marks his triumphant, if sadly posthumous, return with his daughter as his messenger. As I'm sure you know, my father led a double life as a commanding figure in the ivory tower of pure science and as a man of action in constant demand as an advisor, consultant, and decision maker in the long struggle to ensure that the United States and its allies would be triumphant in both the hot and the cold wars that together dominated the half century from 1939 until 1989. The line of demarcation between these two halves of his life is quite clear. During the first half, which spanned his youth in Europe and his early days in the United States, he made fundamental contributions in the realm of pure mathematics and mathematical physics, involving himself in some of the major scientific issues that roiled European intellectuals during the early part of the 20th century. In 1935, though, he symbolically put Europe behind him by resigning from the German, German Mathematical Society, writing, I cannot reconcile it with my conscience to remain a member of the German Mathematical Society any longer. He was equally emphatic 20 years later in explaining his reasons for coming to America. I expected World War II, and I was apprehensive that Hungary would be on the Nazi side, and I didn't want to be caught dead on that side. As soon as he obtained American citizenship in 1937, von Neumann embarked on a collaboration with the US military that lasted the rest of his life first with the Ballistics Research Laboratory of the Army Ordnance Department in Aberdeen, Maryland, and then with the Manhattan Project, and after World War II, with all three branches of the Armed Forces, the Department of Defense, and the Atomic Energy Commission. His work in such disparate areas as game theory, digital computers, intercontinental ballistic missiles, meteorology, and other kinds of mathematical modeling were united in their relevance to real-world problems, including military, economic, and political applications. Although he remained on the faculty of the Institute for Advanced Study, the contemplation of pure mathematics in, its, in those tranquil surroundings was pushed aside by his involvement in crucial issues relating to the security of the United States. He had, as he put it, lost his purity to the dismay of his mathematics colleagues at the Institute. These two aspects of his persona, the ivory tower thinker and the man of action, combined to produce the von Neumann architecture of the modern stored program computer. 
the deep understanding of mathematics, physics, and engineering that characterized the purely intellectual accomplishments provided the necessary brain power. The commitment to freedom that spurred the man of action provided the motivation. Without the exponential increase in compu computational power and speed that the new computer design made possible, the Manhattan Project could never have produced on schedule the weapons that definitively ended World War II and kept the world in the tenuous stability of what Americans called mad, mutually assured destruction during the Cold War. Some of you may have read Turing's Cathedral, George Dyson's fascinating detailed account of how my father and his team built their machine at the Institute for Advanced Study. Here, I'll only note that although my father had hoped that his computer could be built in three years, it actually took six years, from 1946 until 1952, before a celebratory cocktail party was in order. The party at our house <clears throat> had as its centerpiece an ice carving model of the computer, which my father called the maniac, the computer, but which later was given a more dignified designation as the IAS, Institute for Advanced Study, machine. The vacuum tubes were represented by silver thumbtacks, which of course started falling out as the ice melted. A close friend and I kept busy for a while replacing the fallen tacks, but eventually entropy defeated us and the computer became a formless puddle. The fate of the celebratory ice carving was in a way emblematic of the fate of the IAS machine itself. Opposition on the part of much of the Institute's faculty never really faded. And once my father had departed for Washington in 1955 to serve on the Atomic Energy Commission, some members of his team departed, and the ones that remained were poorly treated. At his death in 1957, the computer project was closed, <clears throat> and the Institute's faculty passed a motion decreeing that henceforth no experimental science would again be, con uh, be conducted there. The machine itself, superseded by newer and faster models with the same basic von Neumann architecture, was dismantled. And the brick building in which it was housed became a storage unit for cleaning and maintenance materials. Today, it is shared by a fitness facility and a preschool for the offspring of visiting members at the Institute. Until recently, a segment of the machine, which had been donated to the Smithsonian Museum, was on display at the Museum of American History. With the latest remodeling, that too has been consigned to storage in the attic. But its millions, nay billions of progeny shape nearly every moment of our waking lives and of course are the focus of this conference. Although he was a polymath, my father's genius did not extend to prescience in forecasting the future. He was, for example, profoundly pessimistic about even the short-term future of the human race, as he implied in an article that he wrote for Fortune magazine in 1955, the year he was found to have the cancer that would kill him. Asked to give his views on America in 1980, he titled his response, Can We Survive Technology? In it, he predicted that present awful possibilities of nuclear warfare may give way to others even more awful. <clears throat> in the years between now and 1980, the global crisis will probably develop far beyond earlier patterns when or how it will end, to what state of affairs it will yield, nobody can say. And in this last sentence, he was really reflecting his fear that mankind might not survive another 25 years, but instead become the victim of its own self-destructive inclinations. 
as he had quantified in his letter to his wife, Clara, in 1946 regarding the possible date of the next world war. I don't think it's le two years, it's less than two years, and I don't, th I, I'm sorry, I don't think it is less than two years, and I do think it is less than 10 years. By the time he wrote the article for Fortune, the 10 years had almost passed. My father wasn't a very accurate prophet either regarding what turns the practical applications of his pioneering work would take. For example, he clearly expected that the computer would have its impact primarily on scientific research and military work, even suggesting that the world wouldn't need more than 10 or a dozen of them. He was particularly interested in its role in advancing the accuracy of weather forecasting and ultimately climate modification. And progress in this area hasn't been nearly as far or as fast as he hoped and expected. Similarly, I think he anticipated that the theory of games would have a more immediate impact on military and business decision making than in fact it did. He might have found it a bit ironic that when finally in 1994, the role of game theory in economics was recognized with a Nobel Prize, and then the prize went to, not to the inventors of game theory, von Neumann and Morgenstern, who were long since dead, uh, but to the developers of, a port, of important advances in that field. Unsurprisingly, one of the three winners was another Hungarian, John Hasheny, who had attended the same Lutheran gymnasium in Budapest as my father. On the other hand, if anyone had ever told von Neumann that the comp company I used to work for, General Motors, would produce and utilize literally millions of computers each year, with a growing number in each and every car it builds, not to mention the ones in its plants and offices, I think he would have been astounded. And the notion of adults fulminating against computers as corruptors of youth in the form of video games and revealing photos on Facebook would have amused and perhaps secretly play, pleased the playful childlike side of his personality, and re which was reflected in his love of children's toys. Three of his particular favorites, which sat on his desk and which he often studied intensely for long periods of time, were a bird perched upright on a metal stand that would lean over to drink from a water glass and then write itself on a precise schedule, a hand-blown glass tube filled with soap bubbles, and a wooden disc with everyday objects, a heart and a four-leaf clover, for example, painted on its face, and a metal pointer that when spun, like a roulette wheel, would land on one or another of the painted symbols. When I asked him why he found these toys so fascinating, he explained that each embodied some principle of mathematics or physics. Watching the changing pattern of the soap bubbles after he shook the glass tube, he contemplated the effect of surface tension in making them obey the laws of entropy. Noting where, noting where the pointer on the wooden disc landed <coughs> on spin after spin stimulated his ideas on the laws of probability. Had Legos been invented at the time, he might have built a model of his computer from them. Coming back to forecasting, my father foresaw the inadequacy not only of his own forecasts, but of forecasts in general. In the 1955 article in Fortune magazine, he said, all experience shows that technical change profoundly transformed political and social relationships. Experience also shows that these transformations are not a priori predictable and that most contemporary first guesses concerning them are wrong. On one particular issue, though, my father was eerily prescient, though it has taken more than 70 years for reality to catch up with his foresight. In 1946, he wrote to his friend <clears throat> and colleague, Freeman Dyson, I am thinking about something much more important than bombs. 
I am thinking about computers. Again, his focus was on computers as tools of war, in the form, this time in the form of weather control, which he saw as the most effective weapon in future hostilities. Today, efforts to manipulate weather, or rather climate, are focused rather on the more peaceful goal of preserving the Earth's habitability. But in recent weeks, American newspapers have been carrying articles suggesting that cyber warfare, another descendant of those early computers, has replaced nuclear proliferation as the number one global threat. And now a word about John von Neumann's deep concern about his ongoing legacy, particularly during the last year or two of his life. He was profoundly concerned with the nature of this legacy in, in this world in two respects. One had to do with the durability of his work, his intellectual contributions. He was surprisingly insecure about whether his work would still be recognized in 100 years, to use his own words. Well, the 100 years he had in mind aren't quite up yet, but he might be reassured, not only by the discussion we are engaged in here today, but also by the fact that the royalties I still receive on the books he wrote in the 1930s and 40s and 50s vastly exceed any royalties I receive on my own much more recent publications. Not to mention, of course, that the descendants of his baby, the stored program electronic computer, have profoundly affected every aspect of modern life and human interaction. During his terminal illness, my father summoned his waning energies to compose codas for both aspects of his productive life as a scientist occupied with the life of the mind and a man of action very much engaged in the world. Despite his failing body and the overfull schedule demanded by his position on the Atomic Energy Commission and his continuing participation in a number of military advisory committees, he somehow managed to find time to start preparing his Silliman Lectures, a prestigious series originally scheduled to be given at Yale University in the spring of 1956. The project was particularly important to him because in it, he extended the insights that had yielded the architecture of the modern computer into what was for him a totally new area, neurobiology. The subject was a comparison of the logical processes of the human brain with those of the stored program computer. When he entered Walter Reed Hospital for that last time in April of 1956, the notes for these lectures went with him. And when I visited him that same month, he gave me bits and pieces of his ideas. The Silliman lectures remained unfinished because, as Clary, his wife, put it in her touching preface to the published volume, eventually even Johnny's exceptional mind could not overcome the weariness of the body. But the unfinished manuscript set forth the reasons for his conclusion that the brain's method of operation is fundamentally different from that of the computer. That while the computer's von Neumann architecture means that it operates sequentially one step at a time, the human brain, he said, was massively parallel. That is, it performs an enormous number of operations simultaneously. In <clears throat> Increasingly intensive explorations in neuroscience over the last 50 plus years have, as I understand it, shown that insight to be not only pioneering but prescient. One of my father's most overwhelming fears as he lay dying was that his work would not endure and that he would be forgotten. The unfinished Silliman lectures are but the final addition to a body of work that has given the lie to those fears, but too late for consolation. The second fo focus of, of von Neumann's concern about his earthly legacy was, to put it simply, me. I was his only child, 
And toward the end of his life, he became acutely conscious that all his eggs were in one basket, if, genetically speaking, if biological inaccuracy can be forgiven for the sake of metaphor. So he put tremendous pressure on me to perform up to the peak of my abilities and made clear his displeasure with the path I appeared to be taking. I, got mar I married a week after graduating from university, and he thought that this was a bad beginning. Not because he wasn't fond of my husband, he was, but simply because he feared, and it was a reasonable fear in the 1950s, that a woman who married young was very probably reducing her own chances of making a significant intellectual or professional contribution. His letters became increasingly desperate as my wedding drew closer and his illness advanced. He begged me not to tie yourself down at such an early age, and thus, he said, throw away any chance of fulfilling your own talents. Statistically, he was right, of course, but I like to think that in this particular case, he was wrong. Obviously, I'm no John von Neumann, but I've had a reasonably successful and highly rewarding career, which I describe in my book, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, as an academic economist, a presidential advisor, and a corporate executive. In all those careers, I have been mindful of his insistence that it is immoral not to make maximum use of one's intellectual capacities. Indeed, the most powerful motivator of my academic and professional life has been my determination to escape from the shadow of this larger-than-life parent, my desire to prove him wrong that my early marriage would thwart his hopes and ambitions for my own future. And by the way, on the airplane coming from Detroit to Budapest, my husband and I celebrated our 57th wedding anniversary. Uh, <laughs> I was determined to prove that his expectations for my intellectual and professional success and my own for marriage and children with the man I had fallen in love with while I was still a teenager need not be mutually exclusive. With every new achievement in my life, with every barrier broken, came an overwhelming urge to say to my father, you see, I defied you by doing what I wanted, but I'm also doing what you wanted after all. As my father's remarkable life was ending, I was just becoming an adult, starting out on a life path that would involve me closely in some of the defining events in the 20th century's second half echoing in a minor key his center stage position in the upheavals that had marked that century's first 50 years. I was a pioneer in and an early beneficiary of the feminist wave that swept the country in the 60s and 70s, opening up a dazzling array of opportunities for women to do, who dared to think that they could have it all. I became a teacher of economics, a field dominated by men, and then both an analyst and a proponent of the post-war revival and development of economic interdependence among nations that is today called globalization. I became the first female member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors under Richard Nixon, whose truncated second term marked the dividing line between the pre and post Watergate eras in our nation's political life. And I was a high-ranking executive of General Motors during the years from 1979 to 1992, as the so-called big three auto companies, dominance of the US auto, auto industry, was being relentlessly overtaken by nimbler Japanese competitors and uh, the American industry's inexorable decline toward disaster was underway. To some extent, my involvement in all of these events was pure luck, a matter of being in the right place at the right time. But my parents, and particularly my father, also played a crucial part. The example he set by his life, 
the environment in which he embedded my adolescence, his expectations of me and my responses to those expectations were all critical in shaping my own life. And beyond me is the next generation, the grandchildren whose accomplishments he couldn't foresee because he died far too early before they were even contemplated. I'm deeply sorry that my father never got to know the grandson who has translated a boy's dream of someday finding a cure for cancer into a career as a cell and developmental biologist doing research on the chemistry of intercellular message transmission as a professor at the Harvard Medical School. He would have found comforting continuity, I think, in the fact that our son Malcolm and his colleagues are exploring mysteries of our universe as fundamental as many of those that preoccupied the grandfather that he never met. I'm equally sorry that, could he, that he could never know the granddaughter, who having successfully avoided all scientific subjects during her undergraduate university career, decided to become a physician. Today, she is on the faculty of the Yale Medical School, training medical residents in internal medicine and serving as an attending physician in a hospital clinic that serves mainly a poor population in one of Connecticut's old industrial cities. As teenagers, von Neumann's great-grandchildren have not yet chosen their own life paths but both demonstrate the kind of thoughtful awareness of themselves and curiosity about the world around them that suggests that they will find useful and rewarding lives, even though at the moment they have their parents tearing out their hair from time to time. Because liberating myself from my father's shadow is a major theme of my memoir, The Martian's Daughter, which I'll be happy to sign for anybody at lunchtime who would like it. Uh, I will end with my final paragraph from that book, which brings us back to Hungarian soil. And as I maybe mentioned, that book will be translated into Hungarian uh, sometime, I hope, in the near future. My father's presence was closest in 2003, when Hungary staged a national celebration commemorating the 100th anniversary of his birth. I was invited to participate as an honored guest, an honor that carried, it, carried with it one of the most hectic schedules I've ever encountered. A couple of weeks after finishing treatment for breast cancer, I found myself not only giving talks about my father at internationally attended meetings of the Hungarian Mathematical and Computer, Soci Computer Science Societies in Budapest, but also given informal talks about him in English to students in schools all over Hungary. Thank goodness it's a small country. My husband and I were transported to every corner of it in the cramped elderly vehicle be belonging to Kovács Gyöző, <laughs> who was my father's main self-appointed promoter of my father's memory. And he enthusiastically acted as our chauffeur. Some of the schools we visited were actually named after von Neumann. But in all of them, students knew who he was, what he had accomplished, and had created various exhibitions to honor him. I tried to imagine American high school students according a long dead mathematician, the sort of veneration reserved in our country for sports and entertainment celebrities. That week of talking about John von Neumann's life and accomplishments in the land of his birth brought closure for me, a recognition that what I'd feared were conflicting expectations, my father's, my mother's, society's, and my own, that had shaped my life had finally converged. I had fulfilled my father's moral imperative that I make full use of whatever intellectual gifts I had. My mother's ugly duckling, and I talk about that in my book, had developed a swan's poise and self-confidence. A society where women head the biggest corporations, some of the biggest corporations, 
where half of the Ivy League universities and several of the leading public universities as well, including the University of Michigan, are headed by women, and where a female had been a serious contender for the nation's highest office, and I'm talking about Hillary Clinton and her uh, run for the presidency, which may again come again in, 19, in 2016, sorry. This world now allows the most daring and talented women expectations that far exceed mine. By their own lives, my husband and our children have given the lie to the fears of Bob's mother that all three would pay dearly for my career ambitions. My expectations of a close and loving family life have extended to encompass a third generation. My father's shadow has lifted at last. If we meet again, it will be in sunlight. Thank you.